you know, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're here today to talk about Scranton's American Rescue Plan. I just want to let you know that we are recording this. We will have it up on the website for later reference. And if you do have any questions during the time of this uh, webinar, please drop them in the chat and we will uh, touch base on them after the, after the conclusion of the presentation. Now we'll turn it over to uh, Mayor Cognetti. Hey, everyone. Happy uh, Thursday afternoon. We made it past five o'clock, so I appreciate everybody who's on here um, on a beautiful summer Thursday evening for us to go through this. Um, we are so excited to finally be uh, able to get out some of these funds that we've been working on for so long. Um, we are happy to be able to have had this time while we've been waiting for some of the federal guidance. We've been, we've been happy to do have that time to plan and put together the type of programming, the tri type of uh, funding availability and grants that I think will best serve um, your organizations, all of our residents and all the people that we are trying to take care of and trying to make sure that we not only help ourselves heal from the pandemic, you know, financially, emotionally, but then set us on a course here in Scranton for success. We have been working with Answer Advisory. Uh, I know Desi Navarro is on with us today and some of our other great um, advisors from Answer. It's been wonderful to partner with them as they have been able to guide us um, toward different solutions, different uh, tell us things that have been working in other places and uh, make sure that the things that we're doing, importantly, are in full compliance with the rules for this very very, uh, very special, very once in a lifetime funding that we have. So today uh, we'll go through, uh, I'll kind of just give an overview of ARPA real quick. Um, and then we'll go a little bit farther into the different um, uh, different grants and programs that we have. Uh, the most, the focus today is the nonprofits. It's in the nonprofit funding that will open on Monday. Um, and we've got the Scranton Area Community Foundation here with us that we're going to be partnering with for that. So it's really the nonprofits are there, but we'll touch on a couple of the others that will be coming soon. So I think you all know um, back in 2021, um, it was a $1.9 trillion economic stimulus bill coming from Washington. Um, $365 billion of that went to state and local governments. We worked very hard uh, as mayors across the country to have that money come directly to cities. And we are very happy that that is the is the outcome there. So Scranton got $68.7 million. Um, I know it's a huge, huge number. It's, uh, you know, 60% of an annual budget for us um, and something that's a, a very special thing, but it also makes, uh, makes for a lot of responsibility. And we have done a great job, I think, as a team to make sure that we're putting the right people around us to spend this as effectively as possible. And also in cases where we're able to stack this funding with other funding and maximize and leverage opportunities. I think we have, and we will. So we're very excited about that. Um, in terms of the goals of the rescue plan, it's both the immediate impact of COVID um, with things like public health expenditures and mitigation efforts, medical expenses, the goal to make businesses, nonprofit governments a whole after all of that that financial outlay that was unexpected in 2020 and 2021. There's also those long-term economic impacts, though, um, that, that, that the rescue plan is trying to address. So most of the funding at the, res the, the rescue plan can cover is in uh, the most disproportionately impacted areas throughout the country in a city like Scranton. That means uh, usually our more moderate and low income areas where people were especially hit hard um, by not being able to go to work, by having to adjust their work plans, by having to stay home with children and not being able to have childcare. Um, so we'll, that's a, a key piece of this is that the, the target audience, the target recipient base for this help is those disproportionately impacted areas. Um, but we're so excited to, to be able to have these funds. The different buckets that, that we have, uh, we're going to go through, we've got the public health and education, the housing, economic recovery. There's a host of different um, programs that will be rolling out. Some some that are a little bit farther along in planning than others. Um, again, the key today is about the nonprofits. Um, we've got, I'll have everybody else go a little bit into more detail on those, but it's, it's really to be able to, through our partnership with the Scranton Area Foundation, to be able to get funds out to nonprofits who were impacted negatively by the pandemic, which was 
pretty much everyone. Um, you know, I think everybody saw a dip in fundraising and, and had more difficulty with operational costs. So the idea is for us to help help our community get back on its feet, help those nonprofits get back on their feet. And then we'll also be having, these are not live on Monday, we won't go as far into them today, but we will have um, notices of funding available for literacy and finance, financial literacy for educational catch up. Part of the the idea with the rescue plan funding coming directly to cities is that cities with their with our reach in our communities know the type of educational catch up program that would make a difference, right? So an educational catch up program, a tutoring program, say that if we're able to grant funding to a to an organization to run, that tutoring is going to look different in Scranton than it might in a different community. So that's the argument to make sure that these funds are tailored to the communities they're trying to reach. So we'll have more information out there. Uh, We also have some public health um, opportunities with drug overdose prevention, with behavioral health, with violence prevention. Um, The violence prevention piece especially is something that we're we're really been been looking into in these past weeks along with our police chief um, trying to to decide and, and wanting to bring in and we're talking with a host of different organizations what type of language should be in that grant opportunity so that we can subgrant that out to, to attack that. So again, having the, this money coming straight to the city as opposed to us having to go to the state and come back and then do a, another layer of, of bureaucracy before it, it gets out um, is really, really helpful. Um, other pieces include some wellness programs, some child care affordability programs, and we're still developing um, our small business programs. We are doing some outreach to the small business community to decide what would be the most helpful. Again, what's helpful here in Scranton might be different than what's help- helpful in a different area. We want to make sure that we're tailoring all of our opportunities to you all and to all the residents we serve. So thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Eileen. So I'm Desi with Answer Advisory. And I think uh, the mayor did a great job of uh, outlining all the different programs uh, that the city is currently developing and, and looking to roll out here in the near future. And this, uh, this slide here tries to graphically summarize that for everybody so that everybody's aware of what's currently available and will be made available starting on Monday versus what will be coming down uh, the line here in the near future. So starting from uh, right to left on this slide, you'll see there's a box there that's encompassing some of those programs that the mayor had talked about, some wellness, health and violence prevention services, as well as affordable child care, um, literacy, financial and educational catch up programs uh, and uh, some small business startup and wage supplement programs that are still currently in development will be rolled out later. Um, and then as you move to the left, you'll see some programs as well for homeowners and home buyers. Uh, those will be administered through a subrecipient that is still to be determined. Uh, and then you also see a Living Alley project program that's currently under development as well that will also be administered uh, by a subrecipient. And we'll get into a little bit more of the terms, the definitions, and some of the specifics that you'll want to know as you fill out your application, specifically what is a subrecipient, what is a beneficiary here in a second. Um, but then the last box here on the left, and, and the reason why you all are here today, um, is because the city is opening their subrecipient program for nonprofit assistance. And so the subrecipient that'll be administering that program on behalf of the city is Scranton Area Community Foundation. And they're with us on the line as well today. And they're going to walk us through the application and that process as we get you know further down the line. Uh, but this is how the programs lay out and just a little bit of, of an awareness, um, you know, things for you guys to be thinking about as we go through these slides and, and know that in the future, there are opportunities for additional funding beyond what's just going to open up on Monday. So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about the terms beneficiary and subrecipient. What does that actually mean? Uh, so uh, the way that the Treasury defines this is the city of Scranton is the recipient of the ARPA funds, and they have the ability to either administer those funds directly to beneficiaries, which you'll see in that uh, graphic to the left. It's the you know teal arrow that's not filled in, or they have the option to administer those funds through a subrecipient, which for this program, uh, they've elected to uh, uh, have Scranton Area Community Foundation act as the subrecipient to now administer the, those, those grant funds. So all the applications uh, for this specific program are going to go through SAF, um, but the city is going to ultimately be involved in these as well. Uh, they'll need to uh, as part of their requirements that they need to fulfill to the Treasury. So. 
a quick check checklist. You know, if you're thinking you're sitting there um, thinking, you know, as a nonprofit, I, I saw that there might be some programs in the future that I might qualify as a subrecipient or beneficiary for this program in particular. It looks like I'm just a beneficiary. So how do I determine that for the future um, as, I, as I'm interested or, or maybe interested in some of those programs that are coming? So a quick checklist that we've developed here um, to go through uh, to ask yourself, am I a subrecipient? Well, so what subrecipients do is they'll determine who is eligible to receive federal assistance. Uh, they'll have to measure performance based on meeting objectives of the federal program. Um, they're responsible for programmatic decision making and also for ensuring federal requirements outlined in the award are followed. And um, they're, they're typically using the federal funds to carry out a program as opposed to providing you know, goods or direct services. Uh, a beneficiary, uh, on the other hand, is an individual or organization receiving the funds as the end user or entity that's directly benefiting from the financial assistance. Uh, and beneficiaries, they're not determining eligibility or compliance. That is being done by the subrecipient or the recipient. So in this case, that is being done by SAF. They will determine the eligibility and the compliance requirements. So getting into a little bit more detail there, and this is more so about SAF, so, so we all understand their role and, and uh, how they act in this process. So a subrecipient is an eligible nonprofit 501c3 or 501c19 third party or, or government, government organization, and they carry out uh, the eligible uses of funds on behalf of the city while adhering to 2 CFR 200 requirements, which are basically the administ administrative requirements for federal funding. Um, they are responsible for identifying a COVID-19 public health or economic impact on an individual or community group, and then to design a program or project that directly responds to that impact. And so in particular with, with this program that's rolling out on Monday for nonprofit assistance as beneficiaries, uh, that program is actually developed in conjunction with the city um, to come up with uh, what that design actually looks like. And that's what's been, been the heavy lift over the last few months. Um, there's just a little side note in here as well, is that SAF as the subrecipient will be reviewing applications as they come in. Uh, we'll, we'll be reviewing them as well for eligibility and making sure that um, everything adheres to the requirements that Treasury set forth. But just a side note that greater consideration will be given to programs or, or projects that serve disproportionately impacted or economically disadvantaged individuals or communities within the city. So this goes back to what Mayor was saying earlier about the understanding that the pandemic definitely impacted all of us. We, we all we all had to uh, you know weather the storm, but we, we definitely know that there are areas within the city um, based on um, income levels, location that were more impacted than others. So uh, the goal here is to, to make sure we service those folks. Uh, so some examples of eligible uses uh, under the subrecipient category would be public health programs designed to prevent or mitigate the spread of COVID-19 for an impacted population. So examples of that would be vaccinations, public communication, protective equipment, ventilation systems, et cetera. Uh, behavioral health care programs, violence prevention programs, emergency or affordable housing assistance programs, child care, early learning service programs, drug prevention, wellness programs, and then literacy, finance, and educational catch-up programs, which are really how the city has designed their programs that they intend to roll out here in the near future, really kind of around all of those eligible uses that the Treasury has identified. So beneficiaries, uh, on the other hand, so this is where um, this is where you all will fall that, that have tuned in here to this webinar. Uh, you know, beneficiaries for this program are nonprofits that are 501c3s or 501 c 19s um, In the future, they may also be small businesses, impacted industries, third party and government organizations when those programs roll out. But for this one, it's those 501c3s and 501c19s. So in order to receive funding, and in the application, you'll, you'll see this um, as multiple questions and ways for, your, for you to answer and demonstrate uh, the impact, but they must demonstrate a negative economic impact due directly to the pandemic. Um, and then you, in, in doing so, you're able to request funding that's reasonably proportional to that demonstrated impact. Um, in doing so, you must also provide evidence that the organization serves city residents. And some examples of some demonstrated impacts may include decreased revenue. You know, we know that you know, the pandemic created shutdowns. It had impacts maybe on donations or incoming fees, created some financial insecurity, and may have increased some costs in running your nonprofit. Um, and some of those costs may have gone uncompensated uh, due to greater service need. 
um, any kind of capacity to weather financial hardship or challenges covering payroll, rent, mortgage, or other operating costs are also eligible costs. Um, so just diving a little bit further um, to kind of paint a little more color here and give a little more context, really the, the example examples of eligible uses kind of break down into three major categories. One, the first one, the mitigating financial hardship, which are the examples of the mortgage, rent, utility, or other operating cost assistance. Uh, it also may include technical assistance, including nonprofit development or other, surface, other services uh, that may have supported business planning during that time. The second bucket would be uh, funding to cover costs associated with COVID-19 mitigation and prevention strategies. So uh, there may have been purchases or likely had been purchases for personal protective equipment, things such as gloves, masks, hand washing stations, sanitizer, you name it. Uh, all of those are eligible for reimbursement. Uh, ventilation system installation or improvements that may be past uh, improvements that were done to try and mitigate the spread or um, improvements that you may be submitting for now um, to, to um, do here as you get funding uh, through this program if the application is accepted. So that's definitely an eligible use. Any kind of costs associated with communication and awareness efforts uh, surrounding the pandemic, uh, support for isolation or quarantine, uh, monitoring contact tracing surveillance costs, or costs associated with technology solutions for allowing your nonprofit to operate remotely uh, during the pandemic. We know that that was a big thing for um, a lot of folks, um, especially nonprofits during that time. Uh, and then the last one would be uh, the bucket for funding of eligible capital expenditures. Uh, this one uh, is going to is going to require quite a bit of um, I shouldn't say quite a bit. It's going to it's just going to require um, an application response where the applicant's going to have to. Um, state how the capital expenditure is in direct response to the pandemic and proportional to the pandemic's impact. And it must also provide evidence that this capital expenditure would ultimately serve or provide benefit to city residents. Sorry, city residents. Hey everyone, it's an honor to be able to join you all today. It's, and I'm really glad to see some familiar faces on today's call. Um, Many of you know us, but for those of you who do not, uh, the Scranton Area Community Foundation is a public 501c3 community foundation. Uh, we have assets of more than 57 million and we, we administer about 260 charitable funds. Um, our mission is to enhance the quality of life for people across Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and we've been doing that for the past 68 years. So we try to serve as a steward, grant maker, charitable resource and a catalyst for, for change and growth within our region. Um, we have a system um, called, we, we call it GLM. It stands for Grant Life Cycle Manager. Um, and it's a system that many of you who have might have applied to us, to the Robert H. Spitz Foundation or the Northeast Pennsylvania Healthcare, um, or if you applied for COVID funding um, back when we had the NEPA COVID Response Fund and worked with in partnership with other uh, foundations, um, it's the same system. So hopefully you have a level of familiarity, but we are gonna do a, a little bit of a walkthrough um, on, on the site to make sure you're all familiar and how know how to access it. Um, it's important to note that if you have uh, questions that are gonna be related to um, eligibility or, or content questions for this particular program, they're gonna be best directed to the email that will be shared out uh, for individuals in the OECD office. Um, but if you have technical questions about navigating the site and, and those, those components, that would be uh, through us at, um, as you'll see, grants at safdn.org. So again, that'll be shared, but I think it's important to note that that information uh, will be uh, coming um, up and that you, you will have access uh, to support on that end. So um, I'm going to walk you through again we'll, the, the process and I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Frank to help here as well. Um, the how to apply process will be through our GLM. It's an online grant management portal. Um, all the requests are handled completely through that portal. So we will not be accepting any paper requests, uh, any paper documents, um, or anything via email. So um, everything related to this grant process will be done via the portal. Uh, but again, we'll provide all the resources that you need uh, to make that an easy um, transition for you. There is a link there, a URL um, now uh, that will be sh that has been shared out already. However, uh, if you want just the fast link, it's safdn.org/grants. So that'll take you right into our portal. 
There are some instructions here. Um, it's important to note if you already have a login, which you very well, as I said, might have, have you applied already. Um, so if you would just use your credentials that you've used previously, and if you don't remember them, um, you would just use the forgot your password to have your email reset. If you're not sure if you have an account, it's probably better to check that forgot your password first um, before taking that next step. Um, and then if someone in your organization has already created a login, this is also important. So say you had an individual that did a grant previously for your organization um, and they, um, but they're not the ones submitting this request, then we would ask that you contact us um, because what we'll do is add it to the organization to make sure that the profiles are linked to any previous request. Um, and if you're not sure, again, I would email us just to be on the safe side or maybe we can make sure that they're linked up. However, if your organization has never accessed our online grant portal, uh, we will be looking to have you create your account using um, some basic information. Username is gonna, just going to be your email address, your basic contact information, information about your organization, um, the contact information um, for your executive. Um, and then once your account is created or once you're signed in, if you already have an account, the application will be available on our apply page um, and it will go live um, on the 18th on Monday. Um, so you might see it in the list now, you may not, uh, but the important thing is that you're not gonna be able to hit apply until after 9 a.m. on Monday. We're gonna work to have it at the top of the list, but in case it's not, we're gonna show you what it looks like and how you can view that on that page. So I believe I have access to share my screen if you give me just one moment. Um, so this is what the main page would look like when you first access it. Um, and as I said, it's auto populating my information. This is creating a new account. That's if you're absolutely sure your organization does not have an account or you're sure you do not. Um, again, you can click this forgot your password if you need to reset it or if you want to check if you have an account or not. Um, once you get logged in, it's going to look very similar to this. Now, of course, this is our uh, test site because we, we're gonna, we don't want to affect anything within our live site that you're going to see. So yours is not going to say sandbox behind here. Uh, it'll have your information in the box here. But generally speaking, this is what it's going to look like when you sign in. You can either click on the apply here or uh, most probably you can go to the apply page up at the top. So you'll see here, um, and we're going to try again to put this at the top of the page. If you don't see it immediately, you might have to scroll down. Uh, we're looking for the City of Scranton American Rescue Plan Act program application. Uh, so this is basically just a summary of the program as well as eligibility rules for nonprofits to apply. Uh, we do have a Spanish language version of this as well, which was that top link. And there is some additional information that's more detailed on another guide and that can be viewed where it says here. So you can click on that to view the complete guidelines for this. Once you're ready to apply, you'll see in the top right hand corner, if we scroll up here. So you'll click the apply button in the top right hand corner and that will bring you to the application. And there are, I believe it's six total sections. Uh, so it's gonna start with the organization information. And this is just going to be stuff that is in um, on your organization's account. So the executive director name, year the organization was founded, mission statement, status with the city is if you're in good standing or active status with the city according to taxes and questions along those lines of just getting information about your organization itself. The next section is going to be the grant request information. So this is where you put in the information for the grant itself. I believe it says that there, if the grant request is over $50,000, uh, you have to provide a SAM.government ID number. Um, that again is only if the request is over $50,000. Um, so then you're going to put in the type of grant requested. This is the area. So exactly what the funds are gonna be used for. And because of space limitations, you'll see that um, the options are listed up here. And then you'll want to click on the options below. And we do have all these in English on the left hand side and Spanish on the right hand side. More information about the grant request itself. And then we come down to the COVID-19 impact section. And these questions are asking about how the pandemic affected the organization requesting funds 
Um, so it's going to be asking how the finances were affected, how the programming was affected, staffing, things to that effect. And not all of these questions, when we scroll down a little bit further, there are some sub questions, um, like if the request is for this, then how will you handle that? If that doesn't apply to you, you can put NA. Alternate funding is going to be asking for if throughout the course of the pandemic, your organization received alternate kinds of funding or if you are awaiting subsequent funding as well. And financial insurance information is going to be asking for projected revenue for your current fiscal year, um, projected expenditures, budgetary and insurance information for your organization. And then I believe there is one more section, which is required documents. So here's where you're going to upload a lot of this material that we're gonna need, especially for determining uh, prioritization and eligibility for these. Um, so it's going to be a detailed itemized budget for the program, current copy of IRS W-9 form, tax returns for the last three years. Uh, they're all explained here, so you'll just need to upload those, uh, preferably as a PDF form. Right? And some of these you'll see, they say if applicable, so if that doesn't apply to you, you don't need to upload anything. And after that, I believe it's just the signature section. So once you're all finished, um, just put the name of the grant preparer, the date, and click the you agree to the terms. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, you can click the blue submit application button, and then you should receive an email telling you that it's been submitted and that we've received it. Um, you can also, next to that is the save application button, so you don't need to do it all in one setting. Uh, just be sure that you do click save so you don't lose any of your progress and the due dates down there. But as far as the application goes, that's it. What we would recommend uh, doing is if you have intention to apply, um, again, it doesn't commit you into absolutely doing it, but if you have the intention to apply, would definitely recommend that you go in and um, when the process is open, apply, and at least start filling out some basic information. Um, once you do this, it'll create a draft um, in the system that you can go back to. And again, it's gonna give you a warning for all the questions that are required that have not yet been answered. Um, and now you'll see it under your active requests and you can come in and edit the application from in here. Um, it's also important to note um, that uh, you can also print this packet. You can either print the packet of what you've answered so far uh, or you can just do the question list. This will create a PDF file. Um, so if you need to work kind of outside the system, understanding that maybe multiple people have information that might be relevant. Um, so that's an easy way to kind of take this out of the system. Of course, again, you'll have to go back in to make sure it's all entered within here. Um, but nonetheless, it gives you an easy way to print because this is you know built for online use. Maggie, if I could just pick up on something you said, just so that everyone knows it is not first come first serve, you have till August 12th uh, to be able to complete the application. Uh, we do, depending on how we see people are doing with the application, uh, we most likely will hold another training that would just uh, help individuals walk through the actual application if, um, if you are you know, stuck on some of the questions so that we can be able to help you. So yeah, that's such a, an important piece. Uh, as I said, we, we recommend going in and starting it and getting that draft underway. That also helps uh, us to have an idea of how many organizations are interested. But again, we're not gonna be doing the prioritization based on eligibility until um, all the applications are in. Certainly we'll look at eligibility um, throughout on a rolling basis, but really the evaluation piece uh, where we really look at, you know, prioritizing uh, the applications, um, we'll be doing that um, once all the applications have been submitted. So don't feel like you need to rush to get it in. I think it's more important that the information is filled out uh, clearly and correctly. Um, and to that point, um, I do think it's really critical, um, I, and I probably can't understate this, um, to really go through and review the information that's on the page here. Um, there is a full uh, document available. When you click in here, it'll open up into a separate document. I highly recommend reading through this piece very thoroughly. Um, 
before you really, you know, go into the answering questions and certainly before you hit submit, just to make sure that it's, it's well aligned uh, with the guidelines um, and that you have, you'll have a higher chance, uh, I think, of success if you have a good understanding of what the needs are. That's, I mean, those are the main things that we wanted to cover. And we're, as I said, we're really very happy um, to help with any of the technical aspects of navigating our site. Um, and if there are, you know, any questions, we're happy to take those, I think, at the end. Right, Eileen? Right. And if anybody has any, now you could start putting them in the chat as, as Desi finishes up. Um, so after, I do see there is one question. Uh, after establishing your username, can you enter multiple organizations under that one username? That's a really great question. My understanding is that only one email can be associated with one organization. Um, so we would just recommend in those instances that you use a different email for different um, organizations. Um, I know that makes it a little bit more difficult, um, but unfortunately the system is not necessarily set up to do that. Oh, and the next question, does the nonprofit have to be located in the city? Um, the answer to that is no, but you do need to serve city residents. So the majority, you, you'd be able to, and you need to be able to substantiate that you do serve city residents. And I mean, Maggie, thank you for that. I, we're actually coming to the end of the presentation anyway. The, the, uh, the last couple of slides here are just a, a recap of the timeline. So again, keep your eyes open 9 a.m. on Monday. That's when the go live uh, will, will be clicked from SAF side and then applications will close at 11:59 on August 12th and like Eileen mentioned before you know there may be some additional info sessions that um, we may host if we see you know there's a lot of questions that come up in addition to that keep your eye open for uh, an FAQ that'll be posted on the website as well um, so far we've got a, a few questions already that we've typically seen you know as we've opened up similar programs in other counties or municipalities so we've captured those there, but there may be some specific ones to uh, to you all in the city of Scranton. So it'll be a living document that will update as, as we go along there. I guess the last thing that I do want to hit, just big picture wise, uh, just to kind of recap again, the, the intent and the purpose here uh, so that we're clear, this is really that opportunity for recovery of nonprofits, right? The city knows that you guys do a lot of great work and that that great work uh, was impacted when, when the pandemic hit and was kind of at its, its full strength and we're still not out of it. We're still seeing those impacts and we know that they're continuing to, uh, you know, everybody's continuing to, to press on as best we can, uh, but they wanna make, make you guys whole or look to make you as whole as they can so you can continue doing all that good work that you were doing in the community. Um, with that, um, one last thing on those capital expenditures, which are eligible costs, um, if there are, um, if there are uh, projects in there that are going to require some kind of, you know, contractor design services, you know, for instance, an HVAC replacement in your facility to kind of help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 uh, that may require one or both of those entities. If that dollar amount uh, surpasses um, uh, the threshold that your internal procurement policy states uh, exists for needing to either get three quotes, do a sealed bid process, whatever that is, you will be expected to, to follow your own internal procurement policies for those types of projects. If you do not have one, uh, then you will be responsible for adhering to the city's procurement policy which are also posted and that's part of the FAQ as well. So you know what those thresholds and what those limits are. Um, but that was one thing I, I didn't hit when we went through that category. So I wanted to make sure we stated that here. Um, but with that, Eileen, I think- but Desi, we have a few more questions that popped up. Um, the, the first one, we touched on it just a few minutes ago about having to be physically located in the city of Scranton. The example is the greater YMCA being located in Dunmore. Um, in this case, I think it would be uh, relatively easy to for you to establish um, based on your membership that you are serving a, a significant number of residents from the city of Scranton. Um, so that that one should be um, el you know a positive for eligibility. Is there a minimum or a maximum amount of funding? Um, this funding is we're we're targeting fifty thousand dollars for the for funding. If an uh, entity is able to substantiate that they were significantly impacted, we will go up as, as high as $100,000. But at the end of the day, uh, these decisions, will, we have a million dollars in this uh, funding allotment. So at the end of the day, once we see what the, the, the grand total is of, of ask, um, we will look through and, and try and best to distribute it as fairly and as equitably as, as possible. I think it's also important, probably, Eileen, I know we had, we had talked about as we prepared for this webinar, is it's really important to note that it is reimbursable, uh, a reimbursable grant. 
Um, so it's a little bit different than the usual grant that you might get from the Scranton Area Foundation. Typically, you would expect that we would just, you know, we would cut a check to you for 50000 and then you can use it up um, as, as you need to and then submit a final report. In this case, due to the regulations surrounding uh, this type of grant opportunity, it would be reimbursable, meaning we would have to actually see the expenses or, or some documentation for how those, those funds were used. So, um, and then we would be able to submit for payment of those items. So you would have to substantiate um, with, with receipts and, and other documentation that, that you actually have, have a need for that amount. Um, and also, you know, it, it was mentioned in, within uh, the application review, but any requests that are over, that are 50,000 or over would require you to have a SAM ID and will require a little bit of additional documentation. Um, again, not to dissuade anybody um, if that is if that is your need, um, but it's just something to keep in mind as you're submitting the amount to um, to within the application. Thank you, Maggie. And uh, question here: a Nonprofit can they apply for future grants if they apply for this round? Uh, yes, you can. The only um, the only challenge would be is you cannot duplicate funding. So you cannot apply for something in the future round that we fund it in this round. They would need to be um, two independent projects or a continuation of a project that was not funded under these dollars. We're, we're really thrilled to have so many people on tonight and we're really looking forward to these programs rolling out and making a really significant impact in the city.